Holy Spirit Father I pray that as we transition into your word that you would speak to us and Holy Spirit I ask you one more time would you breathe on this house the wind of God come and breathe on us and we give you honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. Before you're seated this morning, I want you to turn around and I want you to tell somebody you're about to catch another breath. You're about to catch another breath and you can be seated in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I feel the Holy Spirit here. I'm going to tell you something. You know, there's some days when you get up to preach and you feel like teacher, you feel like you're just going to teach. Some days you get up here, you feel like pastor, you feel the burden of the sheep. And there's days you get up here and you feel like the evangelist, you want to go after the lost. In there's days I get up here and I just want to preach. I just want to preach. Is that all right if I just preach this morning? I just want to preach. Uh, Acts chapter 2, you say, well, I, I prefer a pastor who just sit on a stool and give me good little tidbits to take home. And, and um, in Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Ghost fell, the Bible said the people were gathered and Peter raised up his voice. Uh, that means Peter preached. I feel like I'm going to do that this morning. We're in a series on the Holy Spirit. And we're going to continue that series today. And before we talk about the Holy Spirit, I need to set the table for you. And then we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel the 37th chapter. We're in a, in a series on the Holy Spirit. But I want to preach to you on the topic today another breath another breath I want you to just say that again look at the person sitting next to you around you and tell them you're about to catch another breath Ezekiel chapter 37 now I know in the coming weeks we're going to teach we're going to do deep dives on the Holy Spirit we're going to try to teach you about the Holy Spirit um, but I just I feel like the Lord wants to do something today uh, Ezekiel 37 verse 1 when you're there say I'm there if you need a minute, say, wait on me. I'm waiting on you. I gave you five minutes. It's all right. I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. Another breath. Throughout history, God has at times breathed again. How many of you understand that in Genesis chapter 2, God breathed the first time? God breathed on Adam and Eve, and man became a living being. Then, throughout history, God has always sent a second wind. How many of you know what a second wind is? A second wind is when you are exhausted, you are tired, you are weary, but you catch your breath again. You are weighed down. You are heavy laden. But you catch your breath again to keep on running. A second wind, another breath. Ezekiel 37 verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord. And set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. 
Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them. Somebody say prophesy. prophesy. To these bones and say to them, old dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you will live. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them. The skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Somebody say breath. breath. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them. And they lived and stood upon their feet an exceeding great army. Holy Spirit, you wrote it. Help me to preach it and manifest your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. amen. And amen. Ezekiel comes to this valley. And the very first thing he says is the spirit of the Lord brought me to this valley. The spirit of the Lord. Why? Because there was something inside of Ezekiel that could bring life to a valley where there was no life. Now, if I'm going to preach today, y'all going to have to help me. Because I understand resurrection power. How many of you know the whole, how many of you are filled with the Holy Ghost? Throw your hand up. Baptize it, yeah. That Holy Ghost in you is the same Holy Ghost that raised Jesus from the dead. And resurrection power looks for dead things. And so if God ever brings you to a valley full of death, he didn't bring you there to die. He brought you there to bring life. And Ezekiel said, the Lord brought me to a valley and there were many bones. And these bones were dry. The word dried here means withered or lacking moisture. Job 21, 24 says his bones were moistened with marrow. Now, if you understand anything about the bones and the, uh, 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 the, the skeletal system of the body, you understand if you have a bone or joint separation that is severe enough, it keeps the nutrients from getting to the other bones. And watch what it does. It stunts the growth of the body. It keeps the body from growing. So he said they were dry. And I thought about three reasons why they were dry. And I need you to understand something because I am preaching a both and message today. I'm preaching a message to the house and I'm preaching a message to you. Okay. Number one, they were dried by division. Everybody say division. There was no bone in the valley. That was connected to another. There was no unity in the bones to be found. And when there's no connection, when there's no unity, there is no growth. No growth. Matthew 12, 25 said, knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid to waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. How many of you understand the bones were there in the valley, but they weren't together. They were together, but they weren't together. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 
Paul said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of the Lord, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. And I begin to think, isn't it amazing in the body of Christ that we can be together and not be together? We can be in the same room and not be together. We have allowed the devil to divide us. We've allowed the devil to divide us by politics. We've, uh, can you imagine Christians f f losing unity because of the Bible? I would submit to you if we lose unity because of the scripture, we don't know the scriptures. Yeah, okay. We, we've been divided. And, and now because we are more given to culture than we are kingdom, we've now been divided by skin color. The body of Christ is to be a place that the heathen can look at and have to ask the question, who's lying? Is Fox News lying or is the church lying? Is CNN lying or is the church lying? Because when they come to the potter's house, they're going to see black, Asian, white, Hispanic, every creed, every color, under the sun, singing the name. So they got to come in and ask themselves, who's lying? But if we are more given, if our ear is more given to the culture than it is the king, we will live divided and we will be no different than the world. That, that's what separates us. Jesus did not say that you would know them by your love for them. They would know you're his disciples by what? Your love for one another. <laughs> that while you've got white people hating black people, y'all get real uncomfortable. I can feel it. But if we don't talk about it, who's going to talk about it? Racism in our hearts and in the hearts of men. Out in the world, out in the streets, you see it on social media. You see it on the news. And you come to this place where if the church doesn't stand out, we lose our authority in the things of the Spirit. Are we going to disagree? Yes, we're not going to see everything the same way. But guess where I find my commonality with you? Not in my upbringing, not in my abilities, not in my ethnicity. I found my commonality with you, my brother, my sister, at the foot of the cross where Jesus' blood ran red for white, black, yellow, orange, you name it. Whatever color they are, the blood ran red. There's not a white blood. There's not a black blood. There's not an Asian blood. There's not a Hispanic blood. There is one blood. And at the cross of Jesus, it ran to cover the sins of all of humanity, regardless of their upbringing, regardless of their skin color. The blood ran red. But when we allow the enemy in the door of the church, the body becomes divided. And in a divided body, there is no growth. There's no growth. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible said they were in one mind, in one place, in one accord. They were together, together. <laughs> Number two, the second reason they were dry was because of isolation. Everybody say isolation. The bones were in the same valley, but they were isolated. One of the enemy's great plans is to put you in a room and make you feel like you're all by yourself. He could put you in a room of 20,000 people and you could still feel like nobody sees me, nobody cares about me, and therefore you believe the deception of the enemy and you don't connect where God has intended for you to connect. <sighs> Genesis 2.18, the very first warning of the Bible. It is not good. 
that man should be alone. Not good. Psalm 142, 4, I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for me. The scripture said in Amos, two are better than one. For if one falls, the other can help him up. But then we go back to unity. Can two walk together unless they be what? Agreed. So we, we have bought into the deceptive lie of isolation that I can do it on my own. I can carry these burdens on my own. I can walk this faith alone. I don't need the body of Christ. That is the biggest lie you can believe. That somehow COVID changed the importance of the body of Christ. And we've talked about it. I'll talk about it a little bit more. We'll talk about it. Because now there's the online option. And if you're not comfortable because COVID's still here, then God bless you. But the online option has become a comfort to some people. And now it has nothing to do. I'm going to offend somebody. I know it. My my email is toldfield at (laughs) pottershouse.org. But now it's become comfort. It's not about COVID anymore. It's about comfort. And I can just wake up and turn on my iPad, my computer, my television and join in. I'm thankful for online church, but there's nothing like this. And the Bible said in Hebrews 10 that when we see the day of the Lord approaching, we ought to gather more. It didn't preface that with as long as there's not a plague, as long as they're not sick. It didn't preface that. It just said as we see the day approaching, we ought to gather more. And the enemy will isolate you by whispering in your ear. He'll whisper things like you're not enough. You don't fit in with them. That's not your group. You don't need to be here. You're too different. And then he'll whisper that deceiving lie. You don't need church. You don't need church. How am I going to be married to a bridegroom if I am not a part of the bride? There's accountability in connectedness. That when I fall, another can pick me up. When they haven't seen me around for weeks on end, somebody picks up the phone and says, where are you? I've missed you. You need to get back in church. It's accountability. But we believe, we believe the lie of isolation. So now you've got a body who is disconnected and now they're isolated. And guess what? If they're not connected, there's no growth. Then the third reason they were dry was hopelessness. Everybody say hopelessness. Ezekiel 37, 11 said, they have said, these bones have said, our hope is lost. The word lost here is defined, destroyed, ruined, or dead. Acts 27, 20, Paul is on a ship on his way to Malta, on his way to see Caesar. And the Bible said a storm had come and was beating the boat. And one of the men, Luke, who wrote the scripture, lifted up his voice and said, All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. You you ever been there? All hope that your marriage should turn around had been taken away all hope that your finances would turn around had been taken away all hope that your prodigal would come back home had been taken away all hope that you would get out of fear and get delivered from depression and oppression had been taken away you ever been there hopeless Hopeless. Hopeless. Job 24, 12 said, Men groan from out of the city and the soul of the wounded cry out. So here's the picture. Ezekiel is scanning this valley and he sees disconnected, isolated, hopeless bones. Huh? I am so glad that when I see mess... God sees an opportunity. Ezekiel 37, 3, God said, Son of man, 
You've seen it. You've evaluated it. You have analyzed it. And now I've got a question. <laughs> Can these bones live? <laughs> you got to learn. There's sometimes when God asks you a question. He's not necessarily looking for you to answer. He's wondering if you know the best way to do it. And in the flesh, the best way to do it is to say, no, these bones can't live. You kidding me? Dry, beat up. Some of them have probably turned to dust by now. No, these bones can't live. And a lot of times we say, hey, God asked you a question. You say, yes, Lord, I can do that. You, yeah. That's not what God was looking for in Ezekiel. Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel gave us the greatest answer that you can give God when he asks you a question. Oh, Lord God, you know. I don't know, but I know you know. I don't have the answer, but I know you have the answer. Can you be healed? I don't know, but I know you can do it. Can you be delivered? I don't know, but I know you can deliver me. I know you can do it. Can these, but can this army get up? I got questions for you. Can the ecclesia get up? We've been beaten. We've been knocked down. We've been hit. There's been such an exposure that's happened in the church of systems that were not made of God, of structures that were not God made and God breathed. Can the, the true bride of Christ, can they get up? Can your marriage stand up? Can your children stand up? Can you live? It's the question, can you get past this? Dry, disconnected, divided, isolated, hopeless, discombobulated space of life. Mm. Uh, and he said, oh Lord, only you know. And God's answer he said to me, verse 4, prophesy to these bones. Huh? What do you do when God asks you to talk to something that has no ears? What do you do when God asks you to speak over something that has no way of listening to what you're saying? When I speak the word of God, the word of God does not just affect the natural. It speaks into a realm that goes beyond flesh and blood. It speaks into a reality that is more real than what we are experiencing right now. When God asks you to speak to something that has no ears, he's not asking you to speak to the bones. He's asking you to speak to the spirit behind the bones. Uh, hear me this morning. When I, I am able to offend you, not because I'm speaking to you, but I am speaking to the spirit that is in you. And if the spirit that is in you is living and active and convicting, then when I speak the word, any part of your life that's not lined up with the word begins to be illuminated by the Holy Spirit and you are convicted. I'm not saying hard things because I want you to squirm in your seat and leave uncomfortable. I say them because the spirit of God convicts. So when God brought Ezekiel to a valley and he said, prophesy, if we're being honest, if I'm Ezekiel, I'm saying, what? They got no ears. They're dead. He said, prophesy to these bones, verse 4, and say to them, I love the word of the Lord. Old dry bones hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely. Everybody shout, surely. Surely. You know what that word means? It means a change in a scene. It means that God was saying, this scene is over. Cut. 
and we're going to a new scene. We're about to step out of one scene and into a new one. He said, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and live. I'm telling you, I feel like God is getting ready to change the scene again. I, and I'm glad, I don't know about nobody else, but I'm glad that I serve a God who speaks to my end in spite of my beginning. I, I love the Lord because he speaks to my destiny in spite of the way it started. He speaks to my destiny in spite of the way that it's going. He speaks to my end in spite of what I've done in the middle. You see, I read that scripture and something leaped out to me because God told the bones, I'm going to make you live before he ever told the bones to come together. Before the bone ever connected to his bone, God spoke to the armies in and he said, I'm going to bring breathe on you and surely there is going to come life in you. I'm glad I serve a God whose ending for me is not based on my beginning. It's not based on how I was brought up. It was not based on how it started. His end for me is written in the book of heaven and all of my days are before him in spite of me, in spite of my failures, in spite of my flaws. He told that bone dead dry army, I will call breath to enter into you and you will live again. He said the same thing to Moses uh, who had a stutter problem and he stuttered all over himself. Uh, he stuttered every word he spoke. Uh, he killed a man and God said Moses uh, I'm going to raise you up uh, to be a deliverer of my people in spite of your flaws, uh, in spite of your failures because how many of you know that if we had no failures we wouldn't need God but the grace of God covers all of my weaknesses uh, and the grace of God gets the glory when his grace covers me. He spoke to Gideon who was hiding behind a wine press. When Gideon, the Bible said, listen, God had told Gideon before Judges chapter 6 uh, not to be afraid. But Gideon saw the army and was hiding behind the wine press. And what did God show up and say? God, God did not show up and say, I'm so glad that I serve a God who doesn't call me by where I am or what I'm doing or what I've done. He showed up to Gideon and he did not say, you scaredy cat, you need to get out from behind this wine press. No, he showed up and he spoke to Gideon's future and he said, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. You might be hiding in a wine press now, but this is not where I called you to stay. This is not where I called you to be. God never speaks to my present without encouraging me into my future. He did the same thing with David who was out in a field keeping watch over the sheep. Now David could have lived his life and been a shepherd the rest of his life, but God spoke into his future and he said, yes, you're a shepherd now, but there is coming a day that you are going to sit on the throne of Israel and you will never have one in your family not sit on the throne. God never speaks to my present without speaking into my future. He told the bones, before you even come together, I'm going to let you know how this is going to turn out. Before you ever take the next step, I want you to know what the end looks like. I will cause breath to enter into you now. And then he said, continued in verse 6, I'll put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you and I'll cover you and I'll put breath in you and you're going to live. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And then here's Ezekiel. If we want to see the manifestation of God, we must have a heart of obedience in spite of what it looks like. Because if Ezekiel's in the flesh, he's looking at these bones and he's saying, you're telling me to prophesy to a valley of bones. I need somebody to just get that picture with me. That Ezekiel's standing on top of this mountain, I see it, looking at this valley full of bones. And God says, son of man, prophesy. prophesy. God is so committed to you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That when you are dead, dry, disconnected and broken, he will speak to you like you're alive. Because God will call out that thing on the inside of you. 
son of man, prophesy. Ezekiel said, so I prophesied as I was commanded. Now listen, listen, listen. The Bible does not say that when Ezekiel finished prophesying, when Ezekiel put a neat little bow on the word of the Lord, no, 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 no. Ezekiel said, as I was prophesying. So what are you saying? Right in the, God did not wait till the end of Ezekiel's prophecy to perform his word. And there's some of you, God is just waiting on you to take a step of obedience to start moving on your behalf the way he promised you. Ezekiel said, as I prophesied, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling. What's that sound like to you? Sounds like Pentecost to me. There was a, a rattling and bone came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. I'm going to take a minute and talk to you right here about form and order. Somebody say form and order. God is a God of order. Somebody shout order one more time. Order. I said shout, not mumble. Order. 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 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. One translation, uh, uh, translate peace to order. The problem is, our idea of order is being able to trap God in a way we can understand. Can I tell you, in my time of being a believer, traveling to churches, preaching, pastoring, I have seen things that my flesh would call out of order, but my spirit knew was the Lord. You won't talk about it. I've seen people dance on piano tops, and I thought, my goodness, if somebody walked in here, they would think we we're absolutely insane. <laughs> Y'all can laugh. I think we're crazy. But most people would say, well, that's out of order. Get them down. But God was healing them while they were doing that. God was touching them while they were doing that. Our idea of order is let's trap God into a place that we can understand God. I got news for you. You will never understand God. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. We'll never be able to fully explain and understand God. So while, yes, we've got an order of service, we've got a system for that, that order of service is not our end and beginning. It's a start, and when the Holy Ghost says we're done, we're done. And whatever happens in between, it doesn't matter. But we try to form God. Are you, are you with me? And you can try to do that in your own life, your personal life. Wednesday, in, in hearing God in prophecy, we talked about intimacy with the Holy Spirit. There should be no part of your life that's off limits to God. But there are, if we're being honest, there are places that we're off limits on our way to work. What if you were on your way to work, you were already running behind, and the Holy Ghost told you, you need to stop by Starbucks? I just put some of y'all in a quandary. What if though? Is that off limits to the Holy Ghost? Is, is that, uh, what if, you're, what if you're, your day is packed full, but the Holy Ghost says clear your calendar and sit with me? All the planners in the room just shivered. <laughs> what do you mean clear the calendar? But we want God to work in the format of our day instead of formatting our day with God. Are y'all with me this morning? I'm going pre to preach in a minute. It's going to get better. Just hang with me. Before God could breathe, he looked over chaos in the valley and he said, I've got to put order where there is chaos. Now, there's good order and there's bad order. Because bad order is something called form. Everybody say form. Form. There is nothing wrong with form. There is something wrong with dead form. 
There's something wrong when we are, have a, what the Bible say in 2 Timothy 3, 5? A form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. The word form in that scripture, it, it means an embodiment or an appearance. How many of you know, I've met believers, I've met Christians, they have an appearance of godliness. But there's nothing godly on the inside. Mm, yeah. Nothing godly on the inside. They've got a form of it. They come to church. They worship. They lift up their hands. But at home, they, they treat their spouse like they're less than. They treat their children like they're less than. On the job, they cheat. They cheat on their taxes. And then they come to church and lift up their hands and they sing their song. And what? It's an appearance of godliness. Because we are more concerned about face value than we are the heart. There's nothing wrong with, we need to live a holy life. Holiness is still God's way. But when we live holy on Sunday only, and God doesn't have us the rest of the week, I got bad news for you. You're stuck in form. You're stuck in form. See, God, God created Adam and Eve at Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. So Adam is formed. Then he pulls Adam's rib out and forms Eve. And here they are, form, but no life. An appearance of godliness, but no life on the inside. The embodiment of godliness, but nothing on the inside. No life, no walking with God, talking with God. No power in the Holy Spirit. And maybe, maybe, just maybe that's the state of the church in this hour. There's an appearance of godliness. There's an appearance of the bride. It looks like a bride. It talks like a bride, but it doesn't live like a bride. Its affections are still laid at the feet of other men. It's got the dress on. It's got the wedding bells playing. It's got the idea in its head that it's going to get married. But it's not being faithful to the one it's marrying. Ooh. I can feel it. I'm walking hard in here. But let the Holy Ghost minister to you. Maybe it's the state of the church. Maybe it's the state of your life. If people looked at your marriage from the outside, maybe it's all good. But if they got on the inside, maybe it's failing and you are drowning. And it needs God to put it. Did you know that it is not God's will for your marriage to fail? It is not. God is a God of covenant. It's not his will. And some of you in this room, I feel this so strongly. Some of you in this room, you are struggling in your marriage. And you're about to give up. And today's a day God says, don't. Don't do it. Maybe your relationships, maybe your job is for, maybe your parenting, you've got an appearance of godliness, the embodiment of godliness, but something is missing. You file in and out of church, in and out of church, in and out of church, but you're saying on the inside, there's more, there's got to be more. Form. Form. We, we cannot get stuck in the motions of form. We can't. I, I'm telling you, it is so easy to file in and out of church and know what to expect. You know why I love this church? Any given Sunday, I've got no idea what's going to happen. And some of you are like, whoa, that's scary. That's the Holy Ghost. Yeah, we have an order of service. I could pull it up on my phone and show you. We've got our songs in there. We've got what we're going to announce, the way it's going to go. But every Sunday morning before we step in this service, every Sunday morning we open this service and we say, Holy Spirit, none of that matters if you want to come in and just blow it up. And I just, I'm just going to prophesy to you. There's coming a day when I believe the Shekinah of God is going to sit so heavy on the houses of God that want him. We won't, an order of service won't be in our thought processes. I believe the kind of glory that's coming, we won't be able to house the people. 
I'm, I'm, I'm believing the kind of glory that's coming. We won't be able to have kids' classes. they got to sit in here with you and get the Shekinah with you. And I've heard people say, man, I've heard people say, well, if the glory of God came and sat down, wouldn't we all just die? What better way to go? But if the Shekinah comes and I live, I've been changed. If the glory comes and we live to tell about it, people have been healed. Minds have been mended. Marriages have been made whole. If the glory comes, uh -huh. and we cannot get so stuck in the language of church, the form of church, the idea of church, the idea of Christianity, that we begin to do form and have no breath. There's form and order and then there's form and life. Hang with me, I'm almost done. Ezekiel 37, 9, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe. On these slain that they may live. Now I've set the table. Now we're going to talk about the Holy Ghost. In the Bible, wind is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Breath is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So here is Ezekiel. In this valley of bones that have now come together. And God said prophesy. To the Holy Ghost, the wind, and say, Holy Spirit, come and breathe on these slain that they may live. The word breath here in Ezekiel is the Hebrew word ruach. Somebody say ruach. Ruach. You know what ruach means? Ruach means the divine power of God. So what was Ezekiel saying? Prophesy to the divine power of God and say, come and breathe on these slain. The Holy Spirit is a wind. In John 3 and 8, the wind blows where it lists us, and you've heard the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes, whether it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit spiritual wind belongs to God Amos 4 13 he created the wind Psalm 18 10 he flies on wings of the wind Psalm 104 3 he walks upon the wings of the wind Psalm 147 18 he causes his wind to blow how many of you know like fire like Pastor Oldfield talked about last week it's not just seen it's what felt wind isn't seen but it's felt you know the wind is blowing because you can see the manifestation in the trees. You know the wind is blowing because you can feel it blowing through your clothes. You can't see it, but you know it's there. You know it's there. Unless it's 15 degrees outside, which who knows, it might be tomorrow with Ohio. You can't see breath. But you know it's there. Why? Because you're living. You're living. You can't see it, but you can feel it. So is the wind. So is the wind. I, I will never in my life, two times in my life, I'll never forget. The first one was in, in uh, West Virginia at the upper room. We were at a church in West Virginia. The Spirit of the Lord was there. He was moving. It was mighty. It was powerful. And I remember if I'm on the stage, I came up here to the altar and I laid down. There was a stairwell that went up into the balcony. I laid down right by that stairwell. And as, the, as people began to pray, there was no air conditioning in the room. It was the middle of winter, close to winter anyways. There was, there was no air on. There was no vent above me. On my face before the Lord, I felt a wind from my feet to the top of my head. I'll never forget it. Some of you can call me crazy. You can't talk me out of it. It happened to me, not you. The second time, I remember we were right here, probably more like right here. I was doing a worship session, and I was doing it with another one of our, our worship leaders at the time. And I was uh, 
playing and praying and the Holy Spirit, oh man, it was just so thick, so reverent, so holy. I remember saying to myself, there are angels in this room. I remember saying that to myself. And I remember thinking, I'm just going to keep that to myself, but I know I can sense the presence of the Lord. I can feel it. Sitting right there, I felt wind go up my back. Right here, across my back, this way, up my back. I felt it all over me, right here. You can't tell me it didn't happen. I felt it. I knew it was the Spirit of God. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to say nothing, but if, if there's angels in the room and I just felt that manifestation of your Spirit, tell this other person that's leading worship with me to come say something to me. <laughs> I don't want to seem crazy. So I, I faded out. You know, there's probably 10 people in the room. They're wrecked. I don't know how long they're going to be there. This friend of mine that we're, I'm leading worship with, he comes over to me and the very first thing out of his mouth, there are angels in this room. I said, thank you, Holy Ghost. You can't see it, but you can feel it. And I'm telling you, I believe we're about to enter into greater manifestations. And you can say, well, you're crazy. You're weird. That's so weird. No, 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 no. How did God, if you believe the Bible, how did God make a donkey talk? The Bible said in Acts 2 that there was a sound of a rushing, but they heard the wind. That's a, that's a manifestation. They didn't just hear the wind. They saw the fire. God is always manifested in the natural, what he's doing in the spirit. And I believe we're coming into it. But I need to tell you something. We need the Ruach of God. We need the divine power of God. We need the divine unction of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, the very first time that God breathed in Genesis 2 was not the last time that God breathed. And it will not be the last time. God breathed again in Acts chapter, in John 20, verse 22, when the Bible said Jesus was standing there with his disciples and he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2, he breathed and the Bible said there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind that filled the house where they were sitting. In Acts chapter 10 he breathed in the house of Cornelius uh, was filled with the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 19 when Peter was preaching and they said we didn't even know there'd be such a thing as the Holy Ghost. God breathed again and filled them with the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. I'm telling you God is about to send another wind to the ecclesia. God is getting ready to send another wind to the house of God. I remember, I don't remember, but reading in, in 1734 and 43, uh, the great awakening. He breathed again. In 1800 to 1840, the second great awakening. Guess what God did? He breathed again. In the great prayer meeting revival uh, uh, that was in New York uh, through Jeremiah Lamphere, it was estimated one million people were added to the American church rolls and one million of four million existing church members were also converted. In 1904, 1905, we read about the Welsh revivals. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that throughout time when God's body had been worn down, when God's church had been broken, when God's church had been disconnected, when there had been isolation, when there had been pain, when there had been persecution, every time it came, God took a breath in and was ready to exhale over the body again. Ah, the Azusa Street Revival of 1906, God breathed. The Jesus People Movement of the 1960s, God breathed. Brownsville Revival, God breathed. And I believe God is getting ready to breathe on the earth again. I believe the Ruach of God is getting ready to hit the house again. I believe the divine power of God, the Holy Ghost, is coming to the believer again and here was the result he said to them I'm going to make you live and I'm going to open up your grave <laughs> the devil has been trying to bury the church since its existence 
Ah, but when the church looks buried, God opens up the grave again. And he breathes. And the, you're going to come out of your grave. That word open means to let go free. God is about to breathe in such a way that there is going to be a freedom that comes on the body of Christ. Listen. Uh, then he said, I'm going to bring you into the land of Israel, your inheritance. Uh, when God breathes, there's open graves. And then there is a repositioning that happens. Uh, God said, I'm going to take you from this valley and I'm going to put you in the land of your inheritance that I gave into your hand. There's a repositioning. I believe that the world is going to continue to fall into more chaos. But as the world falls into chaos, listen, the church is about to step into a Kairos moment. I believe God is getting ready to bring the church into a polar opposite of what the world is experiencing. You don't believe me? Watch. We're about to see glory in unprecedented ways. Then he said the third thing, then you will know that the knowledge of God. You will know that I am God. When God pours out his spirit, when God pours out his ruach, when God breathes, it is not about the manifestation of gifts. It's not about physical manifestations. It's that when it is all said and done, the people, the church house, the saints of God and the heathen know that there is a God in heaven. Mm -hmm. Then the fourth thing. The fourth thing, he said, I, verse 14, will put my spirit in you. The first time he said it, he said, I'm going to breathe on you. The second time he said it, he said, I'm going to breathe. I'm going to put the divine power of God on you so you live. The second time he said, I'm going to put the Ruach in you I'm going to put power in you I submit to you the last thing the world needs is another declaration of power help me Holy Ghost the last thing this world needs We've got people declaring power all over America. They lay hands on people and say power, and all people feel is cold hands. They lay hands on people and say fire, and all we see is people standing there. No manifestation of it. We got a lot of declaration of powers. We got a lot of clanging of swords in the nations. People are trying to measure themselves against one another. And while they're declaring power, what the church needs and what the world needs is another demonstration of power. Is another demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. You let somebody with a cancer in their body come into a house of God and the demonstration of the Ruach of God hit the house and that cancer fall off of them. I guarantee you. You, you don't find that power in the hospital. The hospital doesn't have that kind of power. The doctors don't have that kind of power. Only the Holy Ghost has that kind of power. You let a drug addict who comes into the church house high and encounters the Holy Ghost and he immediately sobers up. I tell you who has that power. The Holy Ghost. We don't need another declaration of power. We need another demonstration where the alcoholic and the drug addict and the marriage on the brink of divorce and the broken people and the rich people and the poor people come in and see and witness the manifest power of God we need a demonstration of power what would it look like that instead of going to the hospital first for an emergency they said, I know somewhere who can get me instant healing. <sighs> Let me find the church house with the Ruach in it. I know some of y'all say, well, you're crazy. I believe in doctors. I believe in medicine. I take medicine. Don't, don't give me that. But I, I love doctors, but they ain't God. I love doctors, but doctors can't create bones out of thin air. I love doctors, but they can't replace steel plates and backs. I love doctors, but they can't replace screws and bodies. They can't do that. Only God in the demonstration of his power can do it. We need not another declaration, but a demonstration of power. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost fell. 
on them that were in the upper room. And the very next thing you read in Acts chapter 3 is there was a lame man sitting outside the gates of the temple. And Peter and John were passing by. And he was begging for them. And Peter and John said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible said immediately the man leapt to his feet and went about rejoicing. What is that? That's not systems. That's not structures. That's not songs. That's not declaration. That's a demonstration. When he picks up a man lame from birth and he begins to walk and run through the streets and Peter would then preach in Acts chapter 4 and verse 8 when the Bible said that he was full of the Holy Ghost and he stood and said ye men of Israel and rulers of the people if we this day be examined by what good deed is done to impotent man by what means is he made whole let it be known to you and all of Israel that it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that this man stands before you whole for he was set in honor of the builders and he was rejected and now he's become the chief cornerstone and neither is there salvation in any other name under heaven whereby men must be saved in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth and the Bible said when they beheld that Peter and John were uneducated and unlearned men they took notice because they had been with Jesus where does the demonstration of power come from it comes from being with Jesus in Acts chapter 5 the Bible recorded that they would bring their sick into the streets that just the shadow of Peter might cross over them in the book of Acts we read of Peter anointing handkerchiefs and passing them out to all who were sick and they were made whole in Acts chapter 17 the indictment against the church was these are they that have turned their world upside down the world measures power by money status the world measures power by political status but God measures power in miracle signs and wonders God demonstrates his power through the gifts of the Holy Spirit we need a demonstration of power and that kind of power stand on your feet that kind of power only comes from the ruach somebody just shout the ruach comes from the ruach of god uh, ezekiel 36:27 he said i will put I'll put my Ruach in you and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes. I'll put my divine power in you and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes and I don't know about you but we need a demonstration of the power not another declaration I am so weary of laying hands on people and praying they be healed and healing not happening how does that change the Ruach it's not me it's not your hands it's him the divine power of God yeah if you're in this room and you say pastor I want the Holy Spirit to breathe on me again. You say, my marriage needs it. My family needs it. My children need it. Breathe on me. I want you to throw both hands up in the air right now. And I want you to just tell him right now. Just tell him right now. Just say, Lord, breathe on me. Lord, breathe on me. Come on, all across this room. All across this room, come on. Focus your attention here. Just open up your mouth and just say, Breathe on me, Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, breathe on me. The divine power of God. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. I'm going to do it like this. 
if you say pastor I'm, 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 I want to experience the divine power of God in my life I want to experience the Ruach of God I want you to get out from where you're standing and come to this altar quickly come on come on you say I want to experience divine power you can social distance you can wear your mask I don't care but you say I want to experience divine power divine unction I'm not talking about just coming down here and just praying a prayer but you want the power of God the might of God the strength of God the hand of God yeah 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 if you're down here in this altar I want you to lift your hands and I want you to tell him Lord breathe on me come on say Lord breathe on me breathe on me the breath the power's in the breath Lord breathe on me Lord breathe on me Oh, breathe on me. Come on, tell him, tell him, tell him. Tell him, Lord, breathe on me. Come on, right now. 